thank you for joining us today. My name is Paul Rothman. I'm the Dean and CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm here today to talk to Dr. William Moss, who's a longtime expert on vaccines. He has spent his career focused on vaccines, not only on the science, but how to deliver them effectively and equitably. Bill is the executive director of the International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at both the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. Today, we're going to be talking about COVID vaccines and how the vaccination process is going both nationally and internationally. It's a complicated topic, one that I know Bill has thought a great deal about. Thank you for joining us today, Bill. Thank you very much for having me, Dean Rothman. Tell us a little bit about the people who were not presently vac vaccinating, and I'm thinking about two populations, one of which is children, and the other one is uh, who we are vaccinating, but there's some question about it, which is pregnant women or, and also women of childbearing age. Could you talk about those two groups that I'm sure people are really interested in? Yes, these are these are really important groups, um, and uh, they were not uh, those those two groups: uh, children younger than 16 or 18 years of age and pregnant women were deliberately excluded from the the large phase three trials that led to the emergency use authorization by the Food and Drug Administration. For children, this is a very typical process. This is how the process worked. We start uh, in our evaluation of any new vaccine seen in adults, and then uh, what we call age de-escalation, uh, study the vaccines in younger and younger children. Um, and when we get to the younger children, uh, the youngest children, I'll say, um, we need to look at the dosing again, because the, the vaccine dose that we use in adults or even older children may not be uh, ideal for, for the youngest children. So the way this process is working and uh, uh, great progress has been made by uh, with the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines in advancing this, is that the, the next uh, gr group of children in whom we expect to see results are those children 12 to 16 years of age for the Pfizer vaccine, 12 to 18 years of age for the Moderna vaccine. And I expect that we're going to see uh, an emergency use authorization probably in the next, uh, in, in the coming months. Uh, I certainly before the end of the summer and before the next academic year. Uh, Pfizer has already released some of their preliminary data in a press report. Then what's happened now is that the, the clinical trials in younger, in younger children, six years to 11 years of age, two years to, to six years of age, those studies have uh, be, uh, are, are ongoing now, um, but I don't anticipate that we're going to get emergency use authorizations probably until early next year, early 2022, uh, for those younger age groups. Um, now, with regard to pregnant women, this is a very important uh, a special population for vaccinations. We know, uh, and there's increasing evidence, that COVID-19 is a severe disease in pregnant women. Uh, they have three times the risk uh, of developing severe disease, maybe five times the risk of, of uh, ending up in intensive care unit. Um, we see this with other infectious diseases, um, the increased severity among pregnant women. So this is a very important population to protect. Now, again, they, uh, pregnant women were not uh, uh, deliberately enrolled in the phase three trials. But over time, we've uh, accumulated a lot of experience um, in vac COVID-19 vaccination of pregnant women. More than uh, 35,000 pregnant women have been reported through the, uh, the uh, vaccine adverse event reporting system to the CDC. Um, looks like they may have some more soreness at the site of injection, but maybe even decreased uh, systemic uh, signs of, uh, and symptoms. Um, very importantly, there's another mechanism that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has established for monitoring vaccine uh, outcomes uh, among pregnant women and their offspring. Um, the CDC recently presented preliminary data on this. Uh, about 4,000 pregnant women were included in this evaluation. And very importantly, it does not appear uh, that there are any uh, serious adverse events uh, occurring among pregnant women who've received the vaccines. Give me a little bit about what you're looking over the next six to 12 months will happen. Yeah. 
So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to reach some magical point where all of a sudden we're going to go back to our pre-pandemic lives. This is going to be a, a process, a, a phased process in which we slowly return to, uh, you know, more, uh, more normal lives as more and more people get vaccinated and hopefully in the United States as community transmission goes down. If we can uh, get particularly the vulnerable, but but really all of, as much of our population uh, vaccinated as possible, and we start seeing uh, community transmission go down, we're gonna be able to slowly uh, return to normal. And we're gonna see uh, re reductions in the restrictions, first for outdoor gatherings, and then slowly for indoor gatherings. I think uh, uh, contact tracing, uh, quarantine and isolation are going to be kind of our end game strategy uh, as you know we're still going to see kind of pockets of, uh, of transmission and we're going to need to shut those down. Now the issue of, of booster doses and variants is a very important one. Fortunately thus far um, the evidence suggests that our current vaccines uh, are protective, uh, particularly against severe disease, against the variants that we've seen now, the variant that was first identified in the United Kingdom, the variant that was first identified in South Africa. Um, our vaccines seem to be protective uh, against those um, maybe some um, loss of, uh, of efficacy or, or lower neutralizing antibody titers as measured in a laboratory, but still they seem to be protective against severe disease. But this is of concern. Um, and what we need to do very, uh, very rigorously is monitor uh, hospitalization, I think particularly hospitalizations and deaths what proportion of people being hospitalized and dying have been fully vaccinated? Because for me, that's going to be the real red flag. If we start seeing hospitalizations and deaths in people who are fully vaccinated, then we need to be uh, concerned. Some people talk as you think about trying to get vaccines to uh, around the world that perhaps for j and a single dose, so that one's easy, but the Moderna and Pfizer and AstraZeneca are, are all two dose vaccines. What do you think of this idea about only giving one dose of those vaccines to people? Is that is that a reasonable idea? So there's been a, a really vigorous debate uh, about uh, the use of uh, a single dose uh, or de what I, the way I would frame it is delaying the second dose. Um, and there was a rigorous uh, debate here in the United States about this with, you know, experts uh, on both sides uh, of that debate. So this is certainly a question uh, where experts can uh, can disagree. On the one hand are, uh, you know, perhaps the purists um, who will say, uh, and, and Dr. Anthony Fauci has been on this side, you know, the trials were with, with two doses. That's what the science guides us on. Um, and there's at least a theoretical concern that if people get a single dose, uh, there may be some partial immunity that may allow uh, a very, uh, you know, escape mutants to evolve more readily. Um, so there are very smart expert people on the side that we should follow what the phase three trials uh, told us, uh, and that's around two doses, and that we should not be uh, delaying uh, that second dose. Although I will say that the timing of those uh, that second doses was really done for convenience. The three weeks for Pfizer, four weeks for Moderna. That was in part to get us through the phase three trials as quickly as possible um, so that we in the midst of a terrible pandemic. Now, there are many other experts on the other side who say that we would be much better off from a public health point of view, getting a single dose into as many people as possible. We now have you know, increasing evidence that there is uh, protection conferred by a single dose. We're still learning the duration of that protection, but we're still learning the duration of protection of two doses. So in this debate um, uh, with, uh, you know, experts on both sides, I actually favor uh, delaying that second dose and getting more doses uh, into, into individuals, uh, seeing if we can reduce transmission and again, particularly reducing hospitalizations and deaths. 
Bill, I learned a ton today. I so appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and all the work you've done during this whole pandemic. We, we get to, Bill and I get to be on Zooms together and Bill has been really helpful for a variety of folks to inform them uh, and, and to provide your expertise to people both here and around the world. So Bill, on behalf of Hopkins, thank you for what you've been doing during the pandemic and thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much, Dean Rothman. It was my, my great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you all for watching and uh, be safe and, and stay healthy.